performance trajectory. And uh, today is music day, which is, you know, special for me. I'm really, really happy with the panel we have together. And the, our topic today is the globalization of African beats, culture, trends, and opportunities. And I, I know it's gonna be a free flowing conversation. And we're really happy to have everybody here to have a really positive conversation about how, while we're globalizing, we shouldn't forget to localize and domesticate our markets on the continent and link them all. I'm gonna hand over to, just before I hand over to Aldemey Khoury, who I don't know whether I need to introduce him, but he himself is a multi-award winning entrepreneur, a lawyer and an expert across the creative industries. He's the founder of Chocolate City. And last year they did a landmark deal with Warner Music Group to bring the Warner catalog to Africa and promote their catalog across 60 new markets globally. And that's just part of the kind of partnerships we're seeing. So I'll do over to you, but just before that, in Kiru, maybe you want to say something. Oh, no, I'm really good. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for being here. It's amazing to see you all. An amazing panel. We're really excited to have everybody. I'll do it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Um, so we have a very exciting panel. Very, very exciting because we have the five pillars of uh, the music industry, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I'll start with Lady. Um, she might be the only lady on this panel, but trust me, she does the things that 20 men can do. Uh, her name is Yvette Gale. And um, you guys can clap. I mean, clap remotely or whatever. But uh, her, her CV is really remarkable. She's been in the business for over 23 years. Uh, worked with everybody from 50 Cent to Mary J. Blige, Kerry Hilson. And currently is the power behind the Africa Creative Agency, which represents some really crazy artists, um, Pearl Fusi. A bit too see, uh, too see, uh, nasty C and a bunch of other people, so do so, just name it, uh, they have it. So she's representing the agency and talent management side. Um, second, uh, and I think we might go by height in, in this case, uh, C4 Dlamini. Did I get that? I hope I didn't kill your name. Um, he's the Oga on top at Universal Music Group, uh, SA and Sub Saharan Africa. And if you know anything about Universal, you know they have a bunch of iconic labels, the biggest uh, you know, uh, music conglomerate in the world. And uh, just recently, they've announced some really crazy moves across Africa. In Lagos, they're opening Def Jam, aside from the Universal Music Office that they have. Um, his CV is really, really remarkable as well. I mean, he's worked in everything from collecting to live to in the US all the way now uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And just before the call, he was telling us that he'd been quarantined for six months, the longest time in his entire 15, 20 years. So, uh, Sifo, really great to have you. Um, you guys can clap as well. I mean, he's not a woman, I mean, I mean but I mean, just clap for him. It's, it's fine. Okay, okay. And um, the third person is somebody that I really have beef with. Um, we've had a lot of fights in the past, but I think this one is a bit more cosmetic than, <laughs> than any other thing. His name is <laughs> popularly known as Smee. And um, if you've heard of Afro Nation, and if you haven't heard of Afro Nation, about Afro Nation, oh, okay. you have issues because that is the biggest, uh, most prestigious uh, event that's happened over the past two years that has to do with the exportation and uh, promotion of Afro beats around the world. Um, so sometime last year, I heard about Afro Nation and I heard that it was going to happen in Portugal and I was saying, hmm, could this be another of those African things that they do? But this was totally different. They sold out 22,000 tickets in about three weeks. Totally amazing. And then last year they were in Ghana, sold out show. And it was so good that the Ghanaian government said, look, we're going to do a five year deal with you. So please welcome Smay of the um, Afro Nation fame. Yeah, clap for Thank him. You. My beef with him has to do with his beard. <laughs> Let's not talk about that right now. We're going to <laughs> <laughs> um, last but not least is a friend of mine, a brother, uh, and a business partner as well. His name is Jude Abaga, popularly known as M.I. Abaga. Um, his his uh, hip-hop CV and his career CV, I mean, is something that is going to take a few uh, pages to read, so I'm not going to go into that. Instead, I'll talk about what he's doing in terms of being responsible for some of the biggest artists that come out of the continent, Ice Prince, Jesse Jags, Black Bones. I mean, name them. He's, he's been, instrumental in making this happen. Uh, beyond that, he also is a Desmond Tutu Fellow and a UN Ambassador, and he represents the artist a &R, and the agency side in another part. So put your hands up for him as well. So, wow, that took like 29 minutes um, and we have only 15 more minutes left. So let's go into it. I mean, 
this whole globalization of African uh, uh, beats and Afrobeat, I mean, uh, I want, I'm, I'm not going to direct it to anybody in particular because it's a huge topic, but the question really is, is Afrobeats really global? Is it a fad? Is it what happened in Jamaica and to Raga and Raga music 10, 20 years ago, or is this something that is here to stay? And um, let me let me direct this to Smade, actually. Smade, what, what is your take on Afrobeats? I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, um, coming from 15 years ago when um, I dwelt into uh, promotions, promoting the Afrobeats music, I think I got inspired by the likes of the band, I went to see a show by the band, and to the, to the current day. I think we're global. I think um, it's obvious that there's a lot of, there's a huge interest in, in our music. The, the, there's a lot of people from outside the genre that want to collaborate with our artists. You know, there are more shows, more festivals, you know, coming up, you know, like there's Afrobeats this, Afrobeats that. So there's a huge interest in, um, in Afrobeats and I, I strongly believe that we're here to stay, you know, and uh, we, we've still got a lot to offer, you know, because there's a huge talent in, in, in our industry. Um, there's still more to come. So um, I strongly believe, you know, we're gonna, at one point, you know, we're gonna top the world charts. You know, we, we're gonna have so many names representing our Afrobeats and our culture on the world charts. Yeah, sorry about that. But, but wouldn't you already say that we are topping the charts? I mean, Brennan Boy just released an album uh, on the 13th of August and uh, called Twice as Tall. And from all indications, it's going to do twice as well as African Giant. Um, Yvette, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, having come in from coming in from the States and you said your first port of call was Nigeria, you know? So what was that like? And how's that been? I mean, since you've been here, uh, where, where have you seen areas of growth and where do you think it's going to go to? Your, your microphone is muted, uh, Yvette. You're muted. Sorry, I would, I would say South Africa is really my first um, port of call. Um, Nigeria was just some other business dealings for another business that I had um, mm -hmm. in the luxury space. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, all eyes are on Africa right now. Um, and I think all of the music and the talent that's coming out of here is just going to grow and grow. And I think we're finally, I mean, we've been, my company has been on the continent for about 15 years. And when we first started doing work here, there's no one, you know, I used to run the publicity department, the urban publicity department at UMG um, in California for Interscope f and m for 17 years. And nobody was thinking or would have a conversation or kind of thought we were crazy when we were like, we're going to Africa and the talent is there and this is the new frontier and this is where it's going to be explosive. Nobody was even thinking it or hearing it or whatnot. And you look at 15 years later, now it's exploding and the world is seeing. So I think it's only going to continue to grow with the exposure that we are able to do for our artists on the continent. Um, I think it's just about exposure and opportunity and the rest of the world now seeing, you know, the relevance and seeing the chart numbers and seeing the success um, that our artists have. Okay, great. And, and let me, uh, let me ask Sifo. So you are running uh, probably the biggest music, not probably the biggest, you, you represent the biggest music label in the world. And obviously you guys have been in Africa for a few years. Um, what has changed over the past, say, five years for you guys from your perspective? Uh, and let's talk a bit about uh, not just the perception, but let's talk about things like maybe streaming revenue. Let's talk about touring. I mean, you're an expert in live as well. Where do you see those changes happening and, and where do you think it can go, get to over the next three years? Um, so first of all, thank you very much for, for having me on the panel. Um, uh, and secondly, um, yeah, it's made and, and your beard game. That's just not fair. Eh? It's not fair. Um, I've got a hook up for you, though. So don't worry. After this um, <laughs> conference call, I'll yeah. send you my beard kit. 
<laughs> to, to make bread or kid. So yourself and I'll, I'll do a sorted. Don't worry. And MI, if you want to hook up, I got uh, you. I'm not sure MI is a good idea, really. I, I, I would say it would be a waste of resources, but I mean, what do I know? <laughs> 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 and before, before I answer your question, I just want to just touch on your previous question about, you know, is Afrobeats here to stay? And I think we should not be having that conversation. I don't think we should be entertaining the possibility that it's not here to stay. Mm. We have this complex thing where we want to second guess, we want to criticize people on the continent for the things that they're doing. We want to point out when people make mistakes. And we need to stop doing that. Do you know what I mean? Like when 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 dancehall started and it, and it was underground. I mean, Obi was in London at, at the time, probably. We were we were going to clubs in in houses listening to dancehall, right? Nobody was asking the question: Is dancehall around to stay? It was so much in their blood and in their system that they just kept doing what they kept doing. They didn't wait for people to put a stamp of approval and say, okay it's good to stay. And I think as a continent, we've got to stop looking for people to kind of confirm that what we're doing is right or give a, a, a approval that we're in the right direction. And, and we should also be allowed to interpret what Afrobeats means for us whenever we want to, right? It doesn't have to be the same sound all the time. It can develop and grow into whatever that means for us. And we should have that freedom, right? I, th that's the first thing. In terms of the change, um, I think really the digital, um, digital transformation has allowed our music to travel a lot easier. And that has been the, the, the biggest, most powerful thing that they could ever allow us, right? What, what I remember is, you know, being in the UK and if I wanted a CD from Zimbabwe, South Africa, Nigeria, I had to get somebody to mail me a CD over. And then, you know, you had that one copy, right? And, and the, the access to music was controlled by that physical movement of a product. The fact that, you know, you can release a single now in Nigeria and, you know, five minutes later, somebody in Australia can access it in China, in America, it, it's beautiful. And it's allowed our people first and foremost. So we've got to acknowledge that our people globally are consuming our music, which, and which has allowed it to grow. And because our people are so passionate and so loyal around our music, they are telling everybody around them about it, right? So when somebody's at work and they're playing an Afrobeats track or they're playing uh, I'm a piano track, they're, they're playing it with pride and other people are hearing our music and realizing that there's something special in what we're doing, right? So I think that has, that has been the biggest factor in allowing our music to grow. We've always made good music. So it's not just that we've only started making good music now, we've always been doing that. But I think the, 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 the digital space has allowed our music to travel easier, to be consumed easier, and we're seeing that growth everywhere. Well said. Um, so uh, I totally agree with what you said, Sifo. You're right that we shouldn't be asking those questions. But I think those questions will automatically emerge because most of the streaming revenue that we're seeing, most of the traditional sources by which we were accessing music was through the internationals. For example, um, I was on the call about two months ago with one of the biggest distributors here on the continent uh, in, in Africa. And they said 70% of the streams that they're making is, is ex-Africa, it's not within Africa. So you see, to a large extent, some of the, um, some of the um, uh, traditional sources by which music came to Africa, or should I say was authenticated, was not within Africa itself. And my question to you, Jude, I mean, maybe you can incorporate your answer in this, this response is, why is that? And what opportunity, I mean, there's an opportunity right now to build a local, African distribution system, which is lacking. And that is what I think might be the way forward to help solve some of these problems. Because as long as we depend, we're dependent on an international system to make money, it's not truly ours. So Jude, what is your response to that? And anybody can jump in after that. Yeah, um, 
I, I echo Sifo's uh, sentiments of being proud to be on this panel. Um, this is such a great conference. I caught some of the, the conversation yesterday and it was just moving and powerful. So I'm truly honored to be here. Um, also, just, you know, these conversations, especially in 2020, um, I think for Nigeria, it's sort of like a 20 year, maybe a little longer, 22 year, sort of like birthday of the rebirth of our industry. You know, when you trace it back to around the time Remedies and, you know, um, Tribes Men and those guys were starting. And, um, you know, it's just so much history and so much that has happened over the last 20 years. Um, how do you correct? I, I think that, that even though every metric you look at will tell one story, sometimes it's not the complete story. So our music has become popular because of our people. Um, personally, it's, it's, it's thousands of fans that bought 10 CDs of mine and took it around, you know, the continent. It's people like Smade, people like Smade and, and um, Eddie Caddy in the UK and DJ D Money in the US. And like, I'm even, I'm, I'm even speaking of the maybe second generation, right? So we built the industry. It's our, it's our, it's our fans that created this, you know, um, and not all those fans yet show up. The economics of Africa still deny those guys representation when you look at the charts, when you look at your Spotify, your iTunes, right? But they are consuming the music, they're excited about it. They're the reason that these cultures have grown and this music has, has blown up. And I keep saying to, saying to people, because I mean, how do you know firsthand the struggle that, that um, music entrepreneurs have raising funding on the continent? Um, I keep saying to them that, look, this is, it's a revolution that's about to happen. And, and the people that own the real estate before, you know, the, the economics of Africa change are gonna, are gonna win long-term. Uh, unfortunately, um, most of the, the people that hold power in Africa don't see that vision. They talk a lot about investing in young people. They talk about a lot, of, they talk a lot about youth of the future, but when it comes to really investing and building structure and, and, and you know, paying for labels and, you know, sort of playing, I think what Simon Sinek calls like the, um, the infinite game, playing the infinite game of developing Africa for young people, you know, uh, which is beyond what a PNL can show you, right? It's about investing in, in, in people and investing in generations to come. Um, I think that, you know, generally we failed on the continent and, and thankfully, you know, that resilient spirit, um, that music, that beat keeps growing despite, of, despite that. But um, it would be, I mean, anytime now would be a great time for our leaders to join this, you know, join this movement, you know, and, and help us continue to take this to the world. Okay. So, I mean, let me also, so, okay, yeah, and we've just been joined by our fifth panelist, uh, Mr. Oye Akidende. Oye, uh, say hi to, to, to the people. And oh, Oye, Oh, oh yeah, let me give you a small, a, well, a brief background of Oye. He's been in this business for about 20 years as well, though he doesn't look it. He looks 20 years <laughs> old. Um, but he's been in everything from uh, Spinlet, which was one of the first uh, digital platforms, and then he was a uh, regional director for uh, uh, Boomplay. And currently he's the CEO of Music Time, which is an MTN platform that is the, I shall like to say the former indigenous uh, streaming platform. So. Oh, you're yes. welcome. And before you Thank you. Us, we're just talking about um, the fact that Afrobeats is definitely here to stay. I mean, for lack of a better word, Afrobeats uh, generally. Yes, correct. But just mm -hmm. really talking about the fact that there's a lack of infrastructure. And I think it's a good, good um, point of entry for you because the question really is this. If streaming revenue currently in Africa is maybe, I mean, when you think about the current, the music that's been played in Africa, it's 70% ex-Africa. So the question yes. is, what kind of infrastructure policies do we need to begin to expand that? Because the truth is this, right? If we have a billion people on the planet mm -hmm. and we can give just 20% of those people access to internet and they can pay for music affordably and not paying a dollar for a song or whatever those streaming revenues, uh, how that's computed, that will change the power dynamic. That will open up the touring sector locally as well. And that will help for, for bigger shows. Um, so what is, what is your take on that? So um, over the years since, and hello everyone, sorry that I'm a bit late. Um, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, while I was observing, I, I was looking at all the beards 
So hopefully mine was well. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. You're too late to come with me. <laughs> Don't worry. I, I, know that I feel like it's here. I know that person to hook up. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Don't worry. <laughs> so yeah. over the years, right, the biggest challenge for monetizing locally has been um, ease of payment and obviously um, cost of data. So, um, and as I journeyed from one service to the other, um, that problem became more, more inherent, inherent because you kept on finding out that the continent first was um, mobile first. So users consumed on mobile and their, their short pocket just wasn't there. You, you were battling against a generation that grew up on legal free, which is YouTube, right? And um, if you told them to pay for it, they wouldn't pay for it because they could get it elsewhere. And then when you tell them to pay for it, they'll say, so you mean on top of my data cost, I'll still pay for the music. So that was, that was the big, um, the, the first challenge we had, you know? So more and more, what, what, what we've tried to do, and I, I think those are the kind of solutions we need to, to bring in is that, first of all, we know that um, the spending power of our continent isn't as great as the internationals. And that's why the revenue, like Aldo said, is 70% obviously from, from external. But there's an opportunity because there's strength in numbers. Um, there are models like B2B, there are models like even just making sure that um, our products are rightly priced, you know? So um, it's a question I, I'm often asked, would you rather get a dollar from 40,000 people or 30 cents for 400 million. Obviously the answer is clear. So it might not be the exact valuation, it might not be um, the right streaming rates, but um, other, other, other nations like Russia, China, and it's good as CIFO and, and other people that understand um, the, 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 the web price, the streaming rates, right? Those, those kind of, uh, even India, right? The rates are so priced low. So most times when you're trying to do music licensing for local and all that, mm. you have to try and justify that, okay, that first of all, the GDP spend in Africa is low. Um, South Africa is in Nigeria um, because, you know, most times, um, most, of the, most of the licensors have established in, in, in SA and they look at, at Africa as the rest, right? And we, we, it's kind of like an educational process where you have to, tell them that each, each country is different. It's so bad that even where, where I am now, we couldn't actually um, curate properly for Ghana from Nigeria because the music is totally different. You know, you, you, you have to localize everything. So, and that's, what, and that's the question, right? So how do you localize? You have to get the price right, you have to get the model right. You have to, what music time, something like what music time is doing is data inclusion. So um, you know that our users are very, very sensitive to data pricing. So you, 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 you build plat platforms that collaborate, you know, that collaborate with one another, whether it's internationally, whether it's with the telcos, whether it's with the OEMs, you just, you just have to partner. It's all about collaboration. And the more you do that, so whether it's an ad funded model or it's a revenue model, um, uh, uh, a subscription model, then you know that you just have to get the pricing right as well. So yeah. that's it for me. Okay, well, thanks. So, I mean, just, just to clarify, um, the use of Afrobeats is generic, but it's not about Afrobeats. This is Afrobeats. Yes. But let, let me clarify that as well, because there's this uh, tendency that when people talk about African music, they call it world music or they say Afrobeat. Um, yes, there's so, so many people. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's a generic term. Um, the truth is this, right? That this is Africa. And Africa has 52 countries, right? All right. Oh. 54. Oh. My math is bad, forgive me. So it's 54 <laughs> countries, right? And, and the truth is that each region, I mean, even in South Africa alone, the vibe in Cape Town is different from Johannesburg and it's different from Durban probably. Correct. Correct. Right? So there's so many genres which are unexplored. Unfortunately, like every other thing is always about the most pop thing that comes up or that pops up for, for lack of a better word, right? And that's why you keep talking about these same genres. But let's dig a bit deeper. 
Now, if you look at the population, the spread of, um, of uh, the, the, this whole African movement, this goes beyond Africa, right? Yes. If 70% or so of the streams are coming from the diaspora, right? It's very clear that they, we now have a big opportunity on our hands. So let me go back to Smith and just talk about what Afro Nation was able to do in terms of getting a very broad participation because you had artists not just from Africa, but you had from the Caribbean and you had some American artists as well. And in terms of the ideation and how that has affected, so from Portugal all the way to Ghana, what has changed for you? What is the perception? And, and just looking at the spending, uh, the amount of people are ready to spend for that experience. I understand that maybe the average ticket for Afro Nation was maybe 150 pounds or something like that, aside from the ticket cost, things like that. So the question is, how much more do you think this can go to um, from your experience? And then see if I'd like you to jump in after that because you've done- Yeah, so- yeah. So um, I'd like to say before Afro Nation, there's been a process of, um, you know, um, of building the culture, the, the Afrobeat scene in the UK and in the US as well. But I think they all, um, they all push in the diaspora style from the UK, if I must say. Um, I mean, before myself, there were the likes of Coco Bar, Black Knights that were doing it. And then big up to all the, um, the DJs, you know, and the other promoters in the game and every other person pushing the culture. Um, I, I, I would like to also say that there has been no support whatsoever from the government. You know, I mean, uh, there's out of about 100 shows that has happened in the UK in the last 15 to 20 years. I think I've done about 50 of them. And not once have we had, you know, and this is before Afro Nation, not once have we had um, the likes of the ambassadors or any representative from the government to to encourage or to support, you know, the, the, the movement until, you know, um, I, I met my business partner, you know, um, Obi Asika, not this Obi Asika, the other Obi Asika. <laughs> so, cause a lot of people um, yeah. mix them up. Yeah. So um, until I met Obi Asika and um, he, he was a talent agent. He's been, he's been, He's been an agent for the likes of the band Whiskey over the years, and and now they've been doing so, on so many more. You know, I've been doing shows back to back. I remember 2018, I was doing a sh like there was a show every single month, which has never been done before. You know, and we met up. We decided to come together to to present Afro Nation, which you know despite all the negativity and all the, you know, um, all the obstacles and challenges that we had, we pulled it off and it was amazing, successful. We brought people from the UK, the US, and a lot of people from Nigeria and other parts of Africa, Ghana, Kenya, you know, um, name it. Um, it was huge. Uh, the best thing to happen to our music industry, to be honest. Um, Everybody was proud to be African. It was, it was, it was a joyful moment that like a lot of people were looking forward to this year, but unfortunately due to the COVID, we had to postpone it till next year. We successfully delivered Portugal and um, Ghana last year. Um, the president was, the president of Ghana that is, was happy with, you know, the outcome of the festival you know, it was amazing. People came in from all over the world. You know, it wasn't just from the UK or US. People came in from every part of the world. And it was great to see people celebrating, you know, oneness and Africans in diaspora and everyone Wait, locally Wait, was coming Wait, together to celebrate. Sorry, Smith, culture. if I may, how many people attended the Ghana one? Just for people, how many people attended Ghana? Just for people's information as well. So, um, on a daily, we had an average of eighteen to 20,000, but the highest figure we had was about 25,000. And I think that was on the third or last day. We had 25,000 people turn up. Amazing. Amazing. 
And then the one for um, Portugal was 22,000 people. Also, people came from all over the world, you know, and that's just, you know, to answer you that this genre, this movement, this culture is not going anywhere. You know, it's going to continue to grow. I mean, we were targeting to double the amount we did last year in Portugal, if not for the COVID, you know, and it's always going to get bigger. Always going to get bigger. Nice. Sifo? Uh, can, can you repeat the question so that I make sure I, I answer properly? So the, the point here now is, okay, let's go to South Africa, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, DJ Black Coffee um, recently did, I heard he did something phenomenal during the COVID thing. Um, but he's been a big star. And the, the sounds that he's producing are global sounds right now. These are guys that on a regular basis are touring around the world. Uh, these artists are going to from Barbados all the way to, you know, Puerto Rico, you know, and, and, and they're, they're spreading the African gospel, the music. I'm saying that, you know, you, your background was actually in live music at a point in time before you got there. And I know that with Universal, there's a bigger plan around that. My question really is that infrastructure wise, what needs to be put within the continent itself, right? So we can create a local uh, touring network. Right, because Afro Nation came from the UK and established and is doing 25,000 people a day. So there's an opportunity there clearly. So yeah. how does that work? And secondly, in terms of your interface with government, what role does government do you think? I mean, from that perspective, what role do they have to play in making sure that there's that infrastructure and this grows out to be a real, you know, sector, a real industry and not just some fact? Yeah. So I think the first problem that we have on the continent is that one of the barriers to being able to tour in Africa has been a lack of venues where you can plug and play, right? I mean, I remember when, um, when we did the conversion for Zane to Airtel and I was um, executive producer of the event in, in, in Ghana mm -hmm. and um, we did it at, um, what's the big venue? Is it the theater? The, it is a theater, I think, state theater or something. We had to build the stage out of wood, right? So the guys actually cut long pieces of wood and the base of the stage was built on wood. Whereas, you know, in other markets, it was a, a stage like the normal stages that you build now. So the, the, the inability to have multiple venues where you can go in a few days before, build, have your event break down and move on has been a barrier to being able to talk. Fortunately, our parent company, Vivendi, have been investing in this for a while. So they've already built 13 venues in 12 countries in Africa, um, Canal Olympia venues. What those venues are, it's basically there's an indoor conference and cinema, cinema and then an outdoor preset venue with stage, speakers, and, and, and all the sort. And the more we have infrastructure like that, the more you'll start seeing artists touring, right? Because it means that you can fly into a country as an artist two, two days before everything is done, you can do your show and you can move on. The, the, the other problem we have, which, is, which really does need government intervention is the moving of money, right? Anybody that's had to try and do payments between countries in Africa will know that it's a painful task. I mean, even just money moving from South Africa to Nigeria, it can take you a month for that transfer to leave the country because there are reserve bank um, steps you have to go through, there's documentation and paperwork. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it, 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 it's not, a, it's not a, an easy process. Mm -hmm. So part of the challenge people have is, okay, fine, if I go into do a show, how do I get my money out of the country? If I go into Cameroon or Ivory Coast or Senegal and do a show, how do I how do I get money to flow between countries? So the infrastructure is a key element of what we need to get to 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 be able to see touring working effectively. Um, we're trying to do what we can as Universal as as Vivendi, but it requires many people on different levels to work on this. But again, from the government side. We need government. And it's one of the things that I know is, is the African Union has been talking about. 
but we need government to number one, make it easy for money to flow between countries. Number two, um, I don't understand why we need visas to go from one country to another country in Africa. I don't get that. I don't understand. If you're in Europe and you've got a European passport, you can travel anywhere without being restricted from movement. You move from one country, you put your ATM card in the machine in a different country, you get the, the money you need, it's easy. Do you know what I mean? We, we should be able to do the same in Africa because sometimes I know of instances where artists have not been able to travel to, to fulfill a show because they couldn't get a visa in time or because their passport was stuck in an embassy waiting to get a visa. And sometimes your passport is in one embassy for two weeks and you need to get visas for multiple countries. So what do you do if you need to go from South Africa to Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe to Ghana, Ghana to Kenya, Kenya to Nigeria, your, your passport's gonna be stuck in embassies trying to get visa for maybe six months. So we definitely need government intervention. And I think as much as we're trying to drive those conversations in the countries that we're in, we've spoken to IFPI and IFPI has now opened up an office and have a, a representative in Kenya. And it's one of the things that we're tasking them with is also to speak to the African Union and get the African Union to facilitate that travel and money movement in the continent can be easier. In some cases, it's easier to do a show in Europe than it is to do it in another country in Africa. And we can't have that happen. True, true. Yeah, well said, I, I totally agree with you. But let me just also note that, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of the AFCTA agreement. Have you guys heard of that? It's the uh, African, the, in Ghana, the, they just launched the AFCTA, it's long, I can't pronounce it properly, but it has to do with the free trade thing within Africa, the plan is to have an African passport. So once you have this passport over the next three years, this should happen. And so you can travel from one place to the other without needing the visa and things like that. But obviously there's some other issues around travel routes. Do you know that there are places in Africa that you need to fly to France to get a connecting flight to come back to Africa? <laughs> so there's a lot that's going on. But, um, but, but yeah, there is, there's a lot of work to do. But yeah, Yvette, so let's come back to you, our first lady. Um, let, let's talk about a few things around, um, one, the gender issue, right? You will see that it seems that we don't have a lot of women um, in the music industry. It would seem, I didn't say they're not. But interestingly, there's a study that showed, there's a small um, study that was done by the British Council in Nigeria only, so I wouldn't be able to speak about other parts, but it was a small um, mapping. And what they found was that 48% of the creative industries of Nigeria was run by women. Mm. And that these women typically were within the ages, between the ages of 25 to about 39. And they actually were the drivers of most of those businesses. So it's not true that there aren't enough women. Um, I know it doesn't speak very well that we have only one woman in this panel and we're, we're gonna fix that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but speaking about that, where, where's the role of one? Um, I don't wanna say diversity, inclusion. Right, you know, yeah. what's the role of inclusion in this whole thing? I mean, you you come from a very rich background, working with some of the biggest names, and in Africa, it would seem that there aren't enough women involved in that. So, where do you see? I mean, running ACA, I, I looked at your very impressive roster of clientele. Um, what what was that like setting that up? You know, and what are the new opportunities? Because obviously, with COVID, the business models have been disrupted a bit. Mm -hmm. you know, so how are you guys pivoting and what is your plan to take over the whole of the continent as well and to work with other countries? Well, I'll, I'll start about the, the first beat, bit you brought up about inclusion. Like, um, I think there are a lot of women in the industry, but maybe less in the position of power. And I think you have that here. I think you even had that, you know, in America, as many of us um, there were, our biggest plight was where are the black women? Mm -hmm. uh, at the top of the country, uh, at the top of the totem pole. I think when I left Universal Music, I had been there for 17 years, and I think I was the last African American woman, you know, head, yeah. you know, of power besides another young lady in legal. Like, mm -hmm. 
everyone came and went and the doors didn't really swing open a lot, um, especially for women of color to advance as fast as our counterparts did, our white counterparts did. Um, I think I was extremely fortunate because I've always worked um, in a publicity department within a press team um, and was revered for the work that I created and I did. And I had very great bosses uh, and teams and working for Jimmy Iveen was just amazing. Um, and he empowered me. Um, and that was really important. And I think we, especially women executives have to reach down and pull up and skills transfer and train and not be afraid that somebody is going to knock us off our pedestal um, and not be afraid to teach and, and create. And, you know, I spoke at a conference, a women's thing last weekend, and I was listening to a lot of young women talk about how they were having trouble, you know, moving ahead or their bosses. And, and clearly the dynamic is, is quite different in Africa than it is in the US. Um, but I think it, it, you have to also have those strong men that respect the women and help bring them up as well because women can't do it all by ourselves. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second part of your question was, sorry. So the second, I mean, although I'm interested in what you said now, maybe I'll deepen that conversation a bit. Okay. Um, and my question now is to the other panelists. What are you guys doing in your own individual companies to make sure that women are well represented? Yes, you know? Jump in here. Uh, yes. we, we appointed a, a black female COO to Universal Music Group for the content. Her name is Eloise Kelly. Um, the head, in fact, for our live business, interestingly enough, the head of our bookings division is Morgan, a female, and the head of our live event production company is also Louise um, Pillay, who's also a woman. So we're, we, we see that some of the best performing individuals in the business are women. Oh, no. So you know, for, for those companies that haven't embraced and that don't understand that you know, you, you're doing your own business a disservice by not promoting, empowering, and developing women in the business, you're, you're making a huge mistake. Um, you know, we have a very strong representation and it's not, it's not, it's not because we, we, it's politically the right thing to do, but it's also because it's a good business decision to make. Um, again, some of the most hardworking people and result driven, driven and also great at admin, because to be honest, a lot of men suck at admin. The best reports I get <laughs> come from the women. I'm not, and I'm not saying that's all they do. I'm saying they do a lot of different things very well. But also, you know, we have a responsibility because, because we've lived through um, institutional racism, because we've lived through being put aside as Black men and having other people promoted over us. We need to make sure that we don't repeat the same wrongs to females and to women in our space. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility to make sure that if there is a position open in the business, let's try and find women first that can fill that position than just giving it to another man. Let's look harder because the, you know, the, the idea that there's not enough women that can do this is absolutely rubbish. Mm -hmm. Some of the hardest working people. So go and ahead. I, and I think we have to create safe spaces in these workplaces for these women, because mm -hmm. the women that I'm talking to, I'm, I'm just astounded by the, the, okay, maybe it's in the US, we have so many um, sexual advance laws and we have so many um, HR that is, it, that has, you know, we go through training and everybody has to go through all these trainings and it's like one simple comment um, disrespectful can get you written up and whatever. And I listen to the women on this continent and the abuse that they endure, the sexual harassment they endure, not only do, are they not promoted or trained or what have you, but the things that they're going through, you know, in the entertainment industry and other industries as well. Cause I talked to a lot of different women that, you know, mm -hmm. the safe space working environment has to be fixed. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, you, you, you can't continue 
to expect your businesses to thrive and expect women to come in and empower them in whatever and they're being like raped in the bathroom or I mean that might be taking it very far but for women to go to work and feel you know the disrespect that they're feeling mm -hmm. that has to change they have to have a space a safe place um, and unfortunately the women are there, but the men, you guys have got to come to the table and you've got to stand up for your sisters who are being disrespected in the workplace and not taken seriously and, and whatnot. We need you guys to do that. Beautiful. Th thanks so much. Oh yeah, do, do you want to jump in here as well? Yeah, so similar to what Sipov said, the same approach we take. Um, I personally am all, all about um, female and women inclusion. Um, everywhere I've worked, I've, I've empowered women, both in transferring skills. Um, my last stint in Boomplay, um, I left a lady called Tosin Shurana. She's now the director of marketing at Boomplay. Uh, she's the first female um, director for, it, for, for the Chinese group in there. So, um, and where I am currently, as soon as I came on board, I, I told them that I had to head on Gillian Ezra I'm sure all of you on this panel know her. And she's been amazing. And it's just, it's the points I've seen for echoed, right? They're better organizers. I mean, they make your life easier and they make um, your company actually more effective, you know, but, um, and you know, I, I know you know that MTN is, is one for all about um, empowerment. They don't, they're against anything discrimination. Um, even um, our staff in SA, we, we take the B policy very, very important. That's the black first and all that. So um, it's, it's about us just coming together and ensuring that we empower. So if you, if you find a potential in a lady, I mean, try, try and grow her because um, women are like sponge. They work twice as hard because nothing is given to them like how men, you know, men just, I mean, especially in the entertainment industry, um, they're more, if you even look at it, there are more breakout stars than men than women. So women have to always work twice as hard. So when you see, there are no disrespect to our male artists because I, I see them working. I mean, I've seen MI trying to do his album time and time again. I see how much work he puts in. But women, you know, they put in that work just as much and they always have a pro point to prove, you know. So when you look at that, where they're coming from, I mean, we need to make, make it easier or just maybe not even easier. We just need to, level the playing field, you know, and let all of us come on board. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Uh, Judy, you want to say anything? Uh, Smid, any, you guys want to jump on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think to acknowledge, um, I mean, this has been a great, great conference so far, but to acknowledge that even right now, as we talk and we acknowledge the problem, that there are women that, you know, possibly should be on the panel, you know, um, I mean, I can think of Ninel in that's runs an amazing label in South Africa. You know, AK is one of our artists. I can think of Muzoni drummer queen, who started uh, Blankets and Wine in Kenya. Um, I'd be Abidoye, who is a you know head of music for Chocolate City right now, doing an amazing job. Like there are women today that are are doing an amazing job. Um, when I was at Chocolate City Music, we were trying to figure out what the what the reason why there was just so much male talent that was walking through our doors and not enough, not, not, not as many girls. And if you think about it, when the girls do get successful, they outperform, like if you look at what T1 and Yemi, for instance, have done, the length of their careers, the amount of like accomplishments they have, like it's not normal. If you take 10 of the most successful like female artists in Nigeria and just compare them against men, like we have, you know, a shorter like lifespan, shorter like, and we're trying to figure out what it was. And I think um, without having like any like actual data report, I think what we settled on is that very early on um, when people are going to studios, like uh, when Yvette talks about safe spaces, like, you know, those initial meetings, those initial choir meetings where um, the choir director is like, okay, if you don't, you know, or the producer is like, hey, I want to date you or, you know, I, I have feelings for you. And so, I think outside of just looking within the music industry, I mean, the music industry is always gonna be on the forefront of, of you know, liberal ideas, or at least in, in, um, 
in cohesion with liberal ideas just because of the makeup of the industry. But outside of, of that, it's about taking a stand with our platforms to make our societies a better place. Because what we end up seeing is that before you even get like those CVs at the office or whatever, women are probably are already discouraged from being part of the music industry. Before you put out that open call to get female artists coming, you know, women have already been discouraged from like going to studios or don't feel safe in, you know, working with people. And so it's it's not enough for us to just look within our our our, our companies. And, and that is important, you know, but to look at society and encourage people to have those conversations, encourage you know artists to think about the lyrics that they're putting out, you know, um, and you know, I mean, not censoring artists, but you know, encourage you know some of that uh, community work that we're doing. You know, let's do you know, in, in hire female engineers and female producers and train them so that when women go to those studios, they feel safer. You know, so it's a, it's a systemic thing that really, that I feel the heaviest part of the work will happen by what we use our, our platforms to, how we use our platforms to drive change in society, you know, and not just within our, our organizations. Okay, and last but not least, May, do, do you want to jump in? Um, because in your case, 80% of the people- no, I think- um... for, for Afrobeat, uh, for Afro Nation in Portugal, 80% were women out of 22,000 people. So you have a huge female fan base, but what right. are you doing in terms of empowering those people in safe spaces as well? Okay, so uh, I'll talk from my experience and my world of promotions. Um, you know, before 2018, I think there's only been one female headline show, and that was Asha, and that was promoted by Coco Bar. So um, I, in my own little, um, with my own platform, decided to change that narrative. So in 2018, we decided to bring more female acts from Africa out from Africa to promote them here in the UK. And so we had Yemi Alade, you know, amazing person to work with. Our, our performance on stage was awesome. We had Simi, we had Tiwa Savage, you know, and uh, we were talking about working with Shay Shay and um, yeah, and, and all the female acts. I think we need to encourage them more because, um, the emotional, uh, the, the emotional uh, effect that the females have uh, when online or being in the industry is 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 it's, it's terrible. We don't support them enough. They need to be more empowered. You know, um, when I speak to them or when I work with them, like Tenny, just before the COVID, you know, a lot of a lot of we look down on the women too much. We need to bring them up and support them more. You know, um, I think MI said everything, you know, um, there should be more females in positions in the industry and we should empower them more. Okay. So I, I was going to say something and I think that it is very important that we know that we're not doing women a favor. You know, when we say we're empowering women, it's not true. Women are actually empowering us. Because if you run- Women are actually more passionate when you give them tax and jobs to do in the industry, they're more passionate than the men are, honestly. Yeah. And that's why I meant by empowering them. And yeah. No, no, them. no, no, I, I'm not even talking to you. I'm just saying generally for all of us, I'm saying that when we say we're empowering women, it's not true, women empower us. And I'm saying that from my experience working with loads of women on different projects around the world, they make things happen. Um, and I, so I, I think that we need to stop looking at it like, you know, you know how it is like when governments say, oh, we're empowering the youth. No, yeah. we're not empowering no youth. Those youth I, are empowering us. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I know, yeah, I know the funny thing, right? For, for me, I think all through my career, I think apart from my last two jobs, all my bosses have been female, you know, and that's it. That's true. 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 So, yeah, if you were your former boy, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, and, and I think, and I think, I think it's great that we're getting to a point whereby we're now focusing on actually merit, because yes, there's a place for equality and representation, but on the merit itself, there's no yeah. doubt that women were built to multitask. They understand project management; they don't need a course. I need to do a course on project management. The average woman doesn't need to do so. And just looking at how things are happening now, we're working remotely you will see who is who. 
who can put things together remotely, take care of things while making things happen. So I think it's a great opportunity. But moving away from that, and I, I do want to come back to you, Eva, because we didn't totally finish what we were saying, is that you left the US, cushy job, great position, and you came to the motherland. I know that this was a vision that you and Colin had, but beyond that, I mean, what you guys have done now is created the CAA, for lack of a better word, of Africa. Now, one of the things that we find is that there is really a huge disconnect within the continent itself, right? So yeah. you'll find that there are, um, so let me, let me couch it like this. The US says that um, for every song, and Oye, you can correct me on this, is 0 0.00.3 something something per stream in the US, that is their rate. Africa does not have a rate for anything. We all know this. In fact, the contracts that we operate are what they gave us and we bring it, bring it wholesale and we now apply it here. And the truth right. is it doesn't quite work like that. So what are the things we need to do? And this is out to the panel about South the effect. What are the core things from where you sit? Because remember now we have global label and local label here. We have mm -hmm. global artists and local artists here. We have uh, global promoters and local promoters. We have <laughs> global streaming and lo <laughs> global, uh, local streaming as well. What are the things that Africans need to do to fix the problem around infrastructure, a truly African ecosystem, not dictated by the West or the, the North or any of those guys? And how do we make sure that we create um, legacy wealth for the generations to come? Yvette? I mean, I think the one, I think we need to look at all these 54 countries and what we were talking about earlier. It has to start with breaking down those barriers between from country to country to country, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it may sound kind of corny, but I would, I say, you know, we have to unite as one, as one continent, because mm -hmm. I feel like there's so much of, South Africa against Nigeria, against Ghana, against, you know, South, East and West that where there's not like one holistic mindset. And when there's not one holistic mindset, you're gonna have too many divisions between everyone and the continent as a whole is never going to one, build that infrastructure that is strong and unbreakable if you don't start breaking down those barriers. Okay. So, um, anybody want to jump on that? I mean, just from your perspective, uh, um, with you, um, Oye, in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I, I think, the, from experience, I think the problem is that we're so diverse, right? All the countries are diverse. And when you're even just negotiating with the labels, right? Um, and it's not even their fault. It's just that before we could ad um, adopt technology to build a local, um, platforms, um, the internationals had already come and placed themselves in. And um, some of them probably had most favored nation clauses in. So when you're trying to explain to them that these are the rates I want because Nigeria, the GDP in Nigeria is different from the GDP in SA, GDP in Ghana is different. And you're trying to give them different rates for maybe six markets. They're saying that you can be priced lower than an Apple Music that has been, or an iTunes that has been in the continent for a long time. And so we try and, we try and um, go through an educational process by telling them that even the pricing done wasn't good for Apple Music and they stand to benefit more from us if, if they listen, you know? So I think there's strength in numbers, right? And um, as Africa, we need to unite, definitely. But we also need to understand that whatever rate you give to SA, South Africa has to be different from the rate you give to and it's Sotini, for example. I mean, their neighbors, I, I think the exchange rate is even one-to-one, -one, right? Exactly. But far enough, the, when you stream, I mean, the the share of, pocket, um, the share of wallet in a Sotini is definitely not the same as SA. So you can't treat them the same, you know, and same with Nigeria and Ghana and all that. And I also want to touch on um, the, the, the question you had about infrastructures on touring. You know, I think um, sometimes we, we try to look for big solutions, you know. I, I like how music started in bits, right? I like how we took it by, by um, in bits. 
we have we have universities, we have uh, stadiums that life follow when there are no matches. Um, Spade said um, Afro Nation in Portugal was from 2000. Obviously, I like the fact that he's not trying to, I, I know he's trying to ramp up to like a Glatzenbury that would be like 200,000, but you know, starting in smaller numbers, um, touring itself, right, it's easy to do. And all you have to do is just find venues that can size a, 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 an audience that fits you. Uh, we don't know what will happen post COVID, but obviously there's also live streaming. So even those that can't physically attend the shows can obviously watch it digitally. And I also think that, and those are some of the questions I've been on Federation's committee like twice. And some of the conversations we used to have with tourists that went to come into Nigeria was safety and also accommodation. So even around the whole um, touring and concerts, there are support systems that need to be done, improved on um, the road networks, transportation, accommodation, hospitality. There's so much, it's such a huge, I'm happy I'm not in that niche, right? But there's so much infrastructural dependence and collaboration. You know, I know a lot of um, talk and organizers have collaborations with airlines to, to get reduced tickets, they, they talk to hotelers, but in Africa, you know, the road networks are, aren't just there. I mean, you can imagine if a tourist went to come in to Nigeria and said, oh, by the way, I don't check your, your slave trade zone in Badagri. It's gonna take them like half a day to get there because the roads are really bad. The holes in the Badagri road have holes. So that's, that's just saying it lightly. Oh, but yes. Okay. Okay. Well, well, Sarah, I see for you. You want to jump in, so we're we're going to start rounding up this uh, part, and then we will take comments from because there's some really interesting comments going on in the chat box, and you can pop your question in as well. But what I'd like to say, though, I mean, see for just before you jump in, and this is relevant to your response, is that I had a thought the other day. It was a bit of an epiphany, but I'm, I'm sure some people won't really agree with me. Is that in the spirit of reparations? right, in the spirit of BLM, in the spirit of the, you know, what we've gone through as a people and as a continent, whether on this side or on the other side, wouldn't would it make sense for us to ask for um, higher returns on, on the streaming or the exploitation of our content from these big international companies as a means to, you know, compensate us for the, um, the suppression that we've gone through for, for how many, for 400 years, for instance. So for example, if Universal Music is paying me um, for... <laughs> okay, they're laughing already, they're laughing already, they're laughing already. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, I mean, it's very reparations, you know? I, I think we should, we should be given higher rates. I think we should have a different type of split, just automatically. Um, okay. I don't know if you guys saw the, 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 the letter that TI wrote to the to lawyers of London and said, you guys need to pay us such and such. And Lloyd actually wrote back and said, um, well, we see what you're saying. We have these vague programs that we're going to use to, to, to make sure you guys get back on your feet. So see for yeah, what, what, what is Universal going yeah. to do for us? So I'm, 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 I'm glad you started off by saying that we can speak open, honestly, and no one will take offense. And it's a, a robust, healthy conversation, right? So I mean, first of all, my brother Oye, you know, let's be clear. MTN mm. takes the, 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 the lion's share when it comes to music. You guys, before the music gets to the record label to be able to share with the artists, the producers and the, the composers, you guys take what, 70% or whatever the percentage? No, 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 this not anymore, no, not anymore. You know, when I came in, okay, okay. Let, me let, you, let, me, let me let you finish then I'll, I'll, I'll jump yeah, in. Yeah. Oh yeah, write a reply after this. You guys, this is the best part of the yeah. conference. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> so, so, I mean, what, what I'm saying is we have to deal with where there are imbalances commercially <laughs> in, the, in, the music, in the music ecosystem, right? So the, the first thing is, yes, one of the problems we have is some of the telcos on the continent, and I'm not just talking about my brother all year, but some of the telcos, where they facilitate the sharing of music, or the delivery of music, they take more than 50% of the money that's generated. They're not creating the content, they're not paying the artists, they're not paying producers or composers. So we have to fix that, that's number one. Then let's come over to international labels like us and this myth that all we do is we take 
large portions and take the money outside of the country. That's, that's not correct, right? More than 70% of the revenue that we generate as Universal is reinvested back into local talent, local label deals, and joint ventures with African artists and African labels and African partners. 70%. So, so this idea that number one, we're taking more or we're sending more out of the country, it, it's incorrect. Secondly, what we're able to do is we're able to give independent labels or artists that are developing that don't have the money to get started, we're able to give them that finance to, to, to start. And we do it risk-free, right? Let's be clear on this, right? It isn't a loan that we give to a label and say, if you don't make the money back, we take your house, we take your car, and you've got to pay us in installments for the rest of your life. If we invest a million dollars in a project and we lose it, we take that hit. The artist loses nothing. The label that we've worked with don't have to pay it back. So the way that the, 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 the commercial model is built is you take big risk and you earn more. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't pay people more. And in fact, the deals that we're doing, and, and, and I can speak openly about this because I know what we've been doing with percentages. In, in a lot of the instances, we are paying higher royalties to artists in Africa than I see being paid in other markets outside of Africa. There are deals that we've done and, and you know, Yvette can't say anything, but there is one of, the, one of Yvette's artists from East Africa is on a 50-50 deal with us on their project. Do you know what I mean? So, so there are opportunities where, where we are able to, to, to better what's been done before, but it can't be done all the time, right? And, and business is business. If you build your brand to have more value, you have more negotiating power. So if, if you come to a company and you've only just started, you've only got one song that hasn't been released, you can't expect to get the same kind of deal that WizKid might get, or that Tiwa might get, or that Techno might get. It's just, it's just the, 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 the economics of doing business. Okay. Can I think just, just so can thing, I come in now? Can I just throw one thing in there? Um, yes. Just people's point and, and just knowing before I was outside Universal being inside Universal in America, you know, at least Universal to their credit is, um, positioning more of their dollars to come into the country. Am I saying that correctly, Sipo? As far as looking at um, how the global officers overseas are looking at Africa and seeing the talent and seeing the growth and seeing everything, you know, even as an outside consultant, I'm still asked, Yvette, what is it that you've been on the ground for two years? How is it? What, you know, what needs to happen? Let's, let's have conversations and meetings and talk about it. And, and, and I'm on the other side of the fence now, so I, I can see both sides. So I will just say that to see folks to Universal's point, um, they are growing and doing a lot better in that area than some other labels. Okay. Yes. Hey. All right. So Oye. now, oh yeah, time. <laughs> um, would, would you rather I come in as Hello Kuje or Kumudi? Which one do you want? <laughs> anyway, <Both. laughs> um, I can speak only on behalf of MTN, right? So um, there are things that. So let's, let's fast forward to now, the music time. Um, the reason why um, we developed the music time was, so first of all, um, we're running at a loss, right? M10 is running at a loss because they're not giving us the data at a commercial price. They're giving us as an internal price. They had to go and meet all the um, public government agencies to try and get those kind of rates for us. You know, so those are really, really discounted rates that we could give to the users, right? And they have to cover that cost. Now, that said, there's also a billing fee, which they, 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 they've, they've shaved off. So we're not even being billed, right? But in the olden days, right, what would happen is a solution provider like Huawei will come and talk to MTN and say, oh, let's build a platform for you. And, um, and what's your billing fee cost? And 
MTM will go ahead and tell them. And while we will now structure the, the pricing with the uh, content providers. Now, what happens is that obviously the aggregators have different commercial rates with artists. Um, I've known some aggregators to take as much as 80% of what, and then give the artist 20%. So imagine taking 80% or 50% then, so the artist barely left with maybe like 6% out of the 100%. Now, it's all about the food chain, right? And we universal, no, not, not, let me not even say universal, right? But with the majors, what well, I've discovered, and that's why it's very, 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 very it's really, really needed that we grow our, our, our continent locally. Because what we realized is that the actual advance, they're not willing to take the risk with us. They're not willing to build with us, right? They're happy to take minimum guarantees and advances and they don't want to grow with us, right? They don't, um, they do, I mean, there, there are a few like UMG, UMG offers us support. I will not even lie about that. They, when we say, oh, we need talent to, uh, for a 15 second preview, they approve all those things. But when we want to start the, the platform itself, you know, we're asking for, can you start this with us, this journey with us, you know? Don't ask us for minimum guarantees, don't ask us for advances. Let us see how it grows because, and, Inku of all people will know this as well. There's no, there's no service in Africa that has, is profitable. The valuations might be high, but there's none that is running out of profit. You know, um, last year, the one in, 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 owned by Safaricom pulled, pulled the plug. And that was the biggest opportunity for East Africa. Um, so when you keep on hearing things like that, it's because the licensing cost is just too much for a music service to bear. So, yeah. so, 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 sorry, wait, what, what would be a good model that would make sense? And I, I think everyone wants to be educated. What, what would make sense for, for a model that would be win win and that could make So, win -win? We, we understand that, first of all, that users won't pay for music because either that Generation Z or they just can't afford it. Um, ad supported models, the majors shy away from it, first of all. You know, it's so hard for you unless you, you drop a heavy um, advance for um, an ad funded model. You know, so, but that would probably be the best B2B, right? Um, is, is the corporations and organizations that are looking for eyeballs to run their ads and all that. So if you can grow a platform that, that has over 300 active users monthly or daily, uh, 300,000, I said um, um, 300, 300,000 active users daily, you're already in business because advertisers won't come and take some of those eyeballs. You know, YouTube has already proved that it's a fantastic model. A lot of artists in Nigeria, on even the continent, make earnings from YouTube ads, right? And so it's easier for us if we can build platforms like that. It's easier for us to test different subscription models. You know, sometimes we do, and Super knows that we do things called data deals, whereby you buy ten gig of music and and ten gig of data, and you get music with it. Those are called licensing deals. How much discount will you give me on if I was going to and put music onto the our uh, data. So those are the kind of things. Users would rather pay for data than pay for music. And that's the truth. So we need to keep on trying to explore. I remember there was a phone called Solo. I mean it was a, I thought it was an amazing model, right? But it just didn't work out. And I think it was because the device was not right. You know, so they had music phones that you buy the music and you enjoy it. you buy the phone and you enjoy the music for the whole shelf life of the phone. I think that's a fantastic proposition for Africa as well. Wow. So that Different, but, that oh, yeah. different. So, oh, but, 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 but how, because now you're giving music away for free. No, you it wasn't free. Said, it wasn't then, free. So the cost, the cost of the music licensing. So they, they did an average. I, I, was, I don't know about it, but what I would do is I'll factor the cost of a user. So an average user plays about four hours of music a month, right? So they'll factor that cost in into the cost of the phone and they'll sell the phone as is. So you're not giving the music away for free. No, but you see, my, my, my problem is, you know, um, telcos and, and um, device oh, yes. sellers, yeah. they, they, they seem to want to sell their device or sell data, but they want the music portion to be cheap or to be free. The music no. portion is what, is what people are going for. People want the song, but where, where the, the conversation always is around diminishing the value of the song 
whilst protecting the data. So, you know, if, if, we, if we really want consumers to, to hit the, the millions and millions of subscribers that we need, we need to create a balance around the cost of data and the cost of subscribing to a service. And, and that is fair. If you're yeah, that's saying, a device, right. Yeah, if, if you're saying that music should be affordable, not cheap, but should be affordable, but you're also willing to come to the party on the data, then that's a conversation that we can have. But that's a conversation, that's a conversation we've been having. The data cost is really, really cheap. No, it's like bare minimums. But, but you guys... I, I, I don't agree with that way. In fact, I don't agree that you can't say it's, it's affordable. But you know what? Let, no, let no, no. Say. I'm talking about the one on music time, not not on, on, not on music general. time. Yes. Okay. So, so if you don't mind, let, let me hear from 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 an artist himself. So, Jude, what, what is your take on this? Because there's the balance now between access and affordability. What what what's your take on this topic? Uh, I mean, this is a great conversation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, was, I was in the comments uh, stirring up more drama. Um, but um, I think from an artist's point of view, one of the thoughts that crossed my mind is that when, we, when, when we're at these conferences and we start to have these panels, right? And, and I speak as an artist, because I, I sort of am on, um, on both sides, right? I've been on the entrepreneurial side and represented a company and I know how real, you know, that experience is and the fiscal responsibility that you have to your shareholders and to the employees at your company. Mm. Um, but from the artist's perspective, it's like we always end up having these conversations and like these power brokers within the industry end up talking about how the, the, the organization they represent like like, you know, this person is defending the telco, this person is defending the label and the artist is sort of sitting there going like, but like, who cares about me and who represents me? And as you go from country to country and look at like, like especially Nigeria, like the rot of like corruption that is in any sort of organized body. Like, you know, I have my stories about trying to get involved with, with P-Man and I mean, it's better now, but you know, with all these organizations, I think the thing that I'll come back to and, and you know, Audi, again, you asked me as an artist, so that, the eternal idealist and optimist in me says, really, what are we trying to do? When we really take a look at Africa, if, if all of us like that are on the continent now just got up and walked to our window and looked outside and you know, took in a breath of the reality of where we are and came back and sat down and said, what are we really trying to accomplish? And I think what we're really realistically, what we can accomplish is to create something that will make the world better for people that aren't yet born, right? For Africa, that there isn't, this isn't the best situation. And, and, and that's why I, I referenced the infinite game earlier. Saying that- For a second, I, I thought you were gonna say world peace. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he's a good little ambassador for the UN, so maybe that might be what part of his mind. But I also wanna say this, yeah. knowing almost everybody on, on, on the panel and having some sort of personal interaction, I see the people on this panel actually do this. Like what I forget, people that are watching, whatever the conversation is, like most of the people here have good hearts, have been here. I mean, you could just look at Obi Asika and his, his 30 year career of, of always supporting the arts and you know, but if, if, if at the end of the day, our real purpose, our real mission is about leaving the African entertainment space better than we met it not just for corporations, not just for organizations, not just for the bottom line, but for young creatives and for young Africans. I think the conversations will shift a little bit. So, where... so do, 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 let me jump in here. So look, let, let's forget about SIPO. Let's forget about SIPO. Let's forget <laughs> about, about, you know, um, 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 OEA. I mean, these are exploiters, right? In quote. No, 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 no. Wait, Adel, let me say something. Let me say something. Uh, okay. Please, one thing. Okay. Especially especially universal. So I, I had a conversation with a guy called Romain Bulac. I, I hope I got his name right. And he, he came and was scouting for universal. Like, I wanna echo what Yvette is saying that from my perspective, what universal are trying to do is invest in. And that's a completely different model from what other people are, 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 are we see people doing, right? And we can appreciate that, but please go ahead. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll close, we'll, we'll call this the, um, 
uh, universalization of African <laughs> beauty and culture because all we've had is just huge endorsements for universal. But, <laughs> but, but, but seriously speaking, seriously speaking um, there's something that's happened in the music industry now which is disruptive. Um, I don't know if you've been following Steve Stout, but he's saying if MI had a deal with Oye and could talk to Yvette to represent his interest and also Smith to promote him, he might not need a record label at all. What, I mean, so, so that's what it's looking like. What do you guys think? Is that the well, future or what does that mean? Yeah. I, 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 I'm happy to jump in here. You know, I, I think the, the, beauty of, the beauty of business is that if you do your research, if you prepare well, you always have options, right? You have an option of going independent and it works. I'm not gonna say going independent doesn't work because I've run independent labels before. I've managed artists on the other side of the table from a major label. I've been a promoter. So I know, I know the ecosystem, right? The beauty is you can be independent and be very successful. What you need to do is you need to study the ecosystem and need, you need to build the right support system around yourself. So you need good management. You need somebody that can handle your PR. You need somebody that can handle your bookings, right? So no, no question, you can be independent and succeed. But I still think there are spaces for telcos, right? So as much as I might sound like I'm being negative about MTN, I'm not being negative. They're an essential part of delivering music to, to an audience. The number of um, uh, subscribers that MTN has provides the perfect outlet to get your music to somebody instantly, right? The commercials just have to be fixed. So there's space for telcos and music as well. But there are also spaces for you for, for record labels because we're able to invest and support where others might not be able to. So I always say to an artist when they come for a meeting and they say, oh, you're probably gonna to wanna to sign me on an artist deal. I say, no, it depends on what you need and what your plans are. Mm. If you already have good management, if you already have somebody that's doing your marketing and it works, if you have a plugger, if you have you know, people around you that can provide those services, then you can do a distribution deal. You don't need an artist deal because mm. you can handle everything yourself. If right. you need some help with marketing, but you can afford to record your own product, you can master, you can shoot your own videos, then maybe you only need a license deal. And if you've got the money to do all of that, you don't need a label at all. But there are some people that are very talented that don't have the money. And all we do is we give them an option to say, you've got talent, you don't have money to record in a studio, you don't have money to shoot a video. There's some artists that we work with that don't even have money to pay rent. So we find them an apartment, we accommodate them, we give them food and, and, and money to be able to buy food and to get around. So, you know, in the ecosystem, there are spaces for all of us to exist. Mm -hmm. What we just got to do is make the commercials work for everybody, right? So the, the, the problem that we have right now is that Africa has not reached its potential for streaming, right? Apple Music is only in 32 markets of the 54 countries. And if we're being honest, they're only properly in one market. They're not even properly in Nigeria, right? Okay. Spotify is in one market of 54. That, those are only two of the international companies. Then you've got new companies that have come into the play like Boomplay and Udu X that, that are doing great, but they're not in all 54 countries either. So somebody yeah. said at the beginning, we need a, a platform made by Africans for Africans that works across the entire continent. A distribution platform that will focus and put African music first. When I land on the service, I should see Zimbabwe and Botswana and Ghana and uh, um, Cameroon and Ivory Coast and Nigeria. I shouldn't see the European or the American stuff first. Do you know what I mean? We need well, to find platform that prioritizes African content and that has commercials that favor African artists, right? And so I'm not blaming anybody saying it's their fault. It's a solution that we all need to find. Without okay, so 
Okay, so let me jump in. Let me jump in real quick. Oh, oh, um, oh, okay, sorry. So um, yeah. housekeeping. We have ten more minutes, so we need to kind okay. of begin to wind. Okay, I'll be, I'll, I'll be quick and fast and furious. Okay. Um. So basically, right when you, when you look at a solution like Music Time, it's Africa first. It's really really focused and it's localized. So if you if if you have the app, you go into Nigeria, you see Nigeria first. You go to Ghana, you see Ghana first, and and. I know everyone in this panel and even those in the crowd know that when, they, when reports keep on coming out from Nigeria saying um, the entertainment industry, blah, 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 attributes to blah, blah, blah amounts, right? I can, I can categorically tell you that M10 has been the biggest mover as in revenue generator for, for, for artists and music, right? And the other thing is that M10 does stand things that they don't even shout about. Um, next week, next week Friday, for example, they're graduating students from on scholarship from Munson Center. Nobody knows about it, and that's part of the CSR. So you have to understand that even on this Zoom call, right, MTN is going to make money from data, regardless, right? If if there's an MTN user on it, but what MTN is trying to do is they're trying to ensure that they can help build the ecosystem, a proper ecosystem for music. And I'm not even talking about MT, I'm talking about everyone, everyone involved in, in the project that I'm, I'm, I'm working on. First of all, I, I bring in um, people that, that they've even managed artists. So when we're trying to even agree internally on, on the pricing, right? They keep on saying mon music has value, right? They keep on kicking back. They, they talk on behalf of the artist. And the forefront should always be the artist, right? It should be about making an ecosystem whereby you, you bring in enough fans to, to generate enough money for the artists. Because right now, most Africans cannot leave off revenues from music as, as a career, you know, and, and that's a fact, right? You have maybe the top 50 and then the rest, they keep on struggling. They, very soon you find out that they're selling wigs or they're buying and um, building restaurants just to, to attach, but well, making music solely as a career it's really, really hard to, to make a living from that. So I, I think, and I agree, we do need a platform that addresses all of Africa. Okay, all right, so we're wrapping up now um, and I'll have uh, all the uh, panelists just kind of say their, their um, last words and then we'll go to Obi to give us a nice warm wrap up. So let me, let me go to, um, Drew just spoke, um, Smith, please, would you, Round up with some of your comments around the whole space. I remember too, I mean, just and also incorporate the answer around the need for these platforms as alternative sources. Because what, what is becoming very clear is that we're not there yet in terms of streaming revenue. So the money is not as huge, but obviously touring is a big part of that money. COVID has disrupted that a bit. Um, so people are not doing like live streams and things like that. But uh, incorporate that in your answer, please, as you wrap up. Thank you. Well, um, thanks for um having me on this platform uh on this panel um covid affected my business badly you know from canceling afro nation puerto rico to postponing afro nation uh, portugal ghana might not be happening obviously um yeah but these conversations are very very important it's it's i've actually learned more than anyone else on this platform you know um thanks for having me on here. Uh, I'm looking for the look forward to the next one. Okay. Um, and you, you'll share your beer oil, your beard oils with us, as you said. Yes, you bet. Please. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> let's, hear, let's hear your, your thoughts, please, as you round up. Uh, your mic, your mic. See, there's so much noise going on in my house with kids and stuff. I keep putting it on mute. <laughs> But I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, this has been a great conversation and it's been eye opening for myself too as the um, American on board um, and here. And I just want to say the next um, conference that you guys have, I want to see more women, some of those women that they rattled off on. Let's get them on board and to keep the conversation going. But, you know, I think this was great and thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, and let me just also say that we did a lot. Trust me, between Inkiru, Obi, and I, we tried our best to get some, but um, we had a quite a few cancellations. So we apologize. And for all our women, I'm a feminist, uh, just like everyone else in the call. So 
Trust me, <laughs> we're going to get more. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Oye has spoken, uh, Jude has spoken, so I think I should, um, and Sifo has spoken as well. So let me hand it to Obi uh, to just wrap up the, the panel. Yeah, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you so much, guys. I think that was a really, I found it really hard not to say a word. I just put myself on mute so I didn't jump into it. But um, it was really good to hear from everybody. And um, Yvette, again, apologies that you were the sole female voice. We did try. No uh, apologies got... necessary. It's all good. <laughs> but, you know, but thank you for joining us and um, for bringing that perspective. Um, I just wanted to say that I think the, the real takeaway from me is for the need for us to connect our markets, to build our domestic markets, as, so that we keep an eye on home while we're growing globally. And as Sifo has said, and Oye has said, and I think everybody has agreed, to have an African platform that speaks to us as Africans where we can actually meet ourselves. Because the truth of the matter is, young Africans don't know each other well. I mean, I don't think the young Angolans, the young you know, Sri Leoneans, the Ghanaians, Cameroonians, the Nigerians, we can build a bigger mix. So for me, the future is about solidarity, about being together. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, and Q, I don't know if you want to say anything, but from African Soft Power, thank you very much. Oh, I'm totally good. Thank you, everybody. This has been wonderful. The perspective in the room was just like unbelievable. And of course, we're going to have more women next time. We, um, yeah, we did try and we did have cancellations, but you know, I, we're all feminists in the room. Thank you for that. Um, but honestly, wonderful, wonderful from everybody. This was really like an amazing conversation. And we're getting a lot of, you know, incredible feedback as in, like how interesting and how informative it's been. So thank you everybody for turning up. I'll do a great job. Everybody, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, from Africa, Sapa, thanks and um, good night. I'm trying to grow my beard so I can get some of that smade stuff. Yeah, that's <laughs> really true. Like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah, nice one, man. Sifo, great to see you. Yvette, great, great to see you. Great to see you, Yvette. Thank you. Uh, Boy, wonderful. I'll do. You rock. Everybody rocks. Wonderful, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye. We've got, we've got London, South Africa. Thanks, hey, London. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. We had Yankee as well in the room. Yay. Yay. Not everybody, man. It's a global, global black, man. Global black. This is global. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.